live from Dublin and around Ireland. Theatre takes centre stage. Streaming live and focusing on the issues, the art, the craft, the makers. News, hot topics, and artist features. From theatermaker.ie. Tonight, I'll be talking to Maya Nunez and Karen Miano from Origins Ella. We'll be discussing their series of events, Destiny, a constellation of queer Afrofuturist visions at this year's Fringe. We'll then be joined by London-based artist Andy Field. We'll be chatting about his collaboration with the Art Theatre for Fringe, a rainwalk. Finally, I'll be speaking with actress and playwright Eva O'Connor about bringing her play Mustard to the Peacock stage as part of Dublin Fringe Festival 2020 Pilot Light Edition. Also on tonight's show, Luke Murphy, Matthew Bracco and Aoife Hunahan. I'm Kelly O'Doherty and this is Stage Door Live for the 9th of September 2020. Hello again and welcome to Stage Door Live episode 21. Now, before we take a look at this week's headlines, I want to take a moment to say hello and welcome to our new news department interns. We're thrilled to have Rayanna and Sukman joining our news team for a while, helping us bring you the news here on Stage Door Live and as part of the theatremaker.ie website. So do take a moment to check out our website for their new posts, as well as our weekly posts from our wonderful associate producers. Now, let's get into the news. Just this afternoon, Theatre Forum released a new set of guidelines for creating work in the time of COVID-19. The document was created by Theatre Forum along with Kate Ferris, independent producer and head of stage management at the Lear Academy, and Peter Jordan of Slua Event Safety Consultancy, and aims to support production companies, artists and arts organisations. The 15-page document includes protocols for general hygiene, pre-production, rehearsals and production as well as specific guidelines for individual departments such as props, costumes, hair and makeup. You can find the full document at Theatre Forum's website. More mixed messaging from the government this week. Just yesterday, the Cabinet had decided and announced that all pubs, regardless of whether or not they're serving food, would be able to reopen on September 21st without being subject to any change or further delays. Within hours, however, a government spokesperson admitted that it will depend on the situation at the time. This admittance came just before the Department of Health confirmed the daily diagnosis total of 307 cases nationwide, 182 of which were in Dublin. The unnamed spokesperson said, if there is a change in the situation between now and then, it won't just affect the pubs, it will affect all businesses. Ireland's medium-term response to the COVID-19 pandemic is set to be published on Monday and will replace the initial roadmap to recover, which expired in August. By September 21st, non-food pubs will have been closed for over six months. As of yet, there has been no mention of how the potential reopening of wet pubs will affect music and other venues. In other government news, the pandemic unemployment payment will be closed to new applications from the 17th of September. Actor and chartered accountant Peter Daly, who has been an essential contact for many artists and arts workers throughout the pandemic, reached out to the Department of Employment Affairs and Social Protection for clarification on how this would affect people 
who temporarily came off the PUP for short-term work such as gigs and festivals. According to his update on Twitter, the department responded saying, they will be treated like a new applicant and will need to make an application for job seekers then instead. In response to this update, the National Campaign for the Arts have stated on Twitter that they have been in contact with Minister for Social Protection, Community and Rural Development and the island's Heather Humphreys to request a meeting to discuss these issues. After last week's meeting between the NCFA, Minister Martin, Minister Donnelly and Acting Chief Medical Officer Ronan Glynn, there were concerns over the lack of discussions and provisions for the music and live events sectors. However, Minister Catherine Martin met with the Events Industry Alliance last week. A dedicated task force for the arts and culture sector, a pilot live performance event scheme and further engagement from the government around supporting live events, live event organisers and workers may lay in store for Irish performers, according to a statement from Minister Martin following the meeting. More on this story is on our website by Rayanna. In the meantime, the EIA has developed a number of COVID-19 training and induction courses for industry workers, performers, event organisers and anyone else from the Irish events industry. According to their official website, the courses are due to launch from mid-September. And that's not the only news from the department this week. Minister Martin had issued a statement confirming that she has accepted the resignation of Breege O'Donoghue from the Board of Fulcher Ireland, following confirmation that O'Donoghue had holidayed in Spain over the summer. Minister Martin said, I am disappointed to learn that a second member of the Board of Fulcher Ireland travelled abroad this summer. I have sought a meeting with the Board of Fulcher Ireland at the earliest opportunity, at which I will make clear that members of the Board are expected to show leadership during this time of unprecedented crisis in the sector which they represent. This resignation comes after former Chairman of Fulcher Ireland, Michael Cawley, resigned after it emerged that he had taken a family holiday in Italy in the midst of the lockdown. Neve Smith, Fianna Fáil TD for Cavan Monaghan, was appointed as the new chairperson of the Oireachtas Committee on Media, Tourism, Arts, Culture, Sport and the Gaeltacht last week. In the official announcement shared by the Fianna Fáil website, Deputy Smith has said that the immediate focus of the committee has to be how to secure the future of the arts sector. Speaking on her appointment, Smith said, the government are committed to improving the arts industry for those working in the sector. I look forward to inviting specialist groups in to address the committee and ensure stakeholder voices are worked into any legislation or topical matters the committee is working on. According to her Fina Fall page, Neve is embarking on a series of regional consultations where she is meeting and listening to a wide range of people working in the arts. Meetings are planned for Dublin, Cavan, Galway, Kildare and Cork in the coming weeks. This story is covered more in depth on our website. And in a big win for Ireland, Pat Kinavan is the newest recipient of the Helen Hayes Award for Outstanding Performer in a Visiting Production for Solace Newest Production of Silent. The Helen Hayes Awards are theatre awards recognising excellence in professional theatre in Washington DC area since 1983 named in tribute of Helen Hayes, known as the First Lady of American Theatre. Jim Cullerton of Fishamble and director of the production was quoted saying, I am thrilled that his unique, unforgettable performance has been recognised with this prestigious nomination. Congratulations to everyone involved. You can see Silent at Axis Ballymun in November, as well as Pat's other three one-man shows as part of the Axis bootleg season. In programming news this week, we are particularly excited to share today's announcement of the Dublin Arts and Human Rights Festival. The festival, which has been reimagined for the new digital COVID era, will take place from the 16th to the 25th of October, featuring performances, workshops, panel discussions and more. Theatremaker.ie is proud to be a partner in the festival and will be hosting a roundtable discussion on the role and responsibility of the theatre sector in platforming and promoting diverse narratives. Theatremaker.ie founder and producer Kevin Michael Reed said, we are honored to be invited to be a partner and participant in the Dublin Arts and Human Rights Festival, 
As theatre makers first and foremost, we are dedicated to platforming diverse narratives that reflect the world we live in. We hope this is just the start of a bigger conversation. And the No Touching Festival in Belfast have announced their plans to move the festival online. A Twitter update from the festival states that, in light of changing guidelines from the Northern Ireland Executive, we've made a call to no longer have a live audience for No Touching Theatre Festival. All, ticket per all tickets purchased will be transferred to online performances, so the show will go on. Just now, you can watch it lying on your sofa. The festival have teamed, teamed up Belfast businesses to offer ticket holders exclusive discounts from local restaurants, off licenses and more. Make sure audiences can have an excellent night in. Good news for some dancers. Professional morning classes resumed Monday morning in Dance House after six months. This week's classes with Martin Lindiger are ballet, are ballet and next week's are contemporary with Lucia Kickham. But they are already both fully booked. Hopefully we can look forward to more classes and workshops in the near future. In an exclusive, Kickham told Stage Door Live that while teaching last Sunday in the Firkin Crane in Cork, the atmosphere from the beginning to end of the three hours workshop was one of joy, appreciation, enthusiasm and excitement. Space regulations of two metres can make things a little sterile and bland. It's a challenge, but we can work with it for now. You can read more about Lucia's classes on our website later this week. In related news, South Dublin Arts Office and Dance Ireland's choreographic mentoring programme, Emergence, is now open for young applicants. Emergence places young choreographers in a professional mentoring programme to develop a dance piece for performance. Mentoring sessions will be held virtually and live with social distancing rules in place. Applications which are open to choreographers and dancers aged 16 to 25 close Thursday 8th of October at 5 p.m. To wrap up with some intriguing international news, some exciting rumours circulated on Monday morning that Banksy, who has remained anonymous since he began operating in the 1990s, was in fact 90s Art Attack show host Neil Buchanan. Similarities include the fact they're both musicians, Buchanan, most known for his massive artworks that had to be viewed aerially, was a member of heavy metal band Marseille. Fans of Banksy's work claimed that several of his recent installations had popped up where Marseille had previously played gigs. However, later that day, the rumour was allegedly debunked by Buchanan himself. But surely Banksy would say exactly that. That's all the news we have time for tonight. But there's plenty more happening in Ireland and worldwide. Be sure to check out our website, theatremaker.ie, for more detailed news stories, including details on Oliver Dowden's Operation Sleeping Beauty in the UK. Our newly expanded news team is hard at work publishing daily. If we missed anything, please do send us your press releases and suggestions to news at theatremaker.ie or slide into our DMs on social media. If you find value in Stage Door Live, Please help us grow by letting your friends and followers know. If you're watching on Facebook, hit that follow button and give us a like. Take a moment to share this live feed with your friends and followers right now. If you're watching us on YouTube, make sure to give us a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel and click that bell to keep updated on our new and exclusive YouTube content. Your support helps us continue these important conversations about Irish theatre now and into the future. A big thank you to everyone who has joined our Patreon community. Your support is invaluable. For as little as five euros per month, you can become a patron of theatremaker.ie and support the work that we are voluntarily doing. We are not a funded organization, nor do we consider ourselves a business. So please consider supporting us. We're posting a link in chat now, and it will also be in the description after the show. Tonight, I'm delighted to be joined by Maya Nunez and Karen Miano, founders of Origins Ella. 
Origins Ella is a grassroots community responsive organization dedicated to creating safe spaces and platforms for queer, trans, intersex, indigenous, black and people of color. Origins Ella is currently running an array of events entitled Destiny with the Dublin Fringe Festival, which runs till the 20th of September. Maya and Karen, welcome to Stage Door Live. Hi, how are you? Oh, great, thank you. It's brilliant to have you both on with us. So, Karen, I'm going to start with you. Um, for this year's Fringe, Origins Ella have put together a four-part programme. Could you tell me why it was important for you to have a panel discussion, an online gallery, a dinner and a reading list? Um, I think we just wanted to different elements of um, Afrofuturism, which is the theme of this year's um, array of events. Um, it's been described a couple of times to us as as a festival, which we weren't really thinking of it like that. Like to us, even though a dinner and a panel discussion and a reading list and an exhibition may seem like very uh, disjointed things, it, it they really they really have an uh, for us. Um, in terms of like Origins Ella, like we are a community uh, based organization, if you want to call it that, um, before anything. So for the dinner, it was really about a congregation of sorts and to have people be in space with each other, especially seeing as a lot of uh, people within our community probably come from backgrounds where they may not be 100% safe in the spaces that they are. Um, and yeah, it just we needed a gathering. There's been so much, um, there's been so much isolation happening, which I know everyone is suffering from, and everyone's like, ah, I just want to see my friends. But I think it's especially important when your friends are your family as well, your chosen family. Yeah. Yes, absolutely, um, very important. Um, it sounds like you've been very busy with all of that, Karen um, and Maya. Um, so. How did this program come about then? Um, I'll direct that question to you, Maya. Um, I think this, this program kind of evolved organically. Um, so I think that um, in thinking about the themes, the theme of Afrofuturism, like all of these different events represent different components of um, the project and kind of, I guess, what what Origins Ella seeks to do as an organization in general, in the sense that I suppose the exhibition is very kind of like outward facing. Um, it's very much about giving people a platform, giving um, queer black folks a platform. It's very much about creating a space that sits outside art institutions that allows people to um, express themselves uh, without, I guess, being um, burdened or limited by the, um, by the, I guess, like dominant narrative or the dominant structures of uh, white supremacist, cis, hetero, capitalist patriarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. then the dinner was very much about like meeting each other in person um sort of like congregating it's about community care it's about nourishment and um, the reading list is more is more internal and it's kind of about more about personal growth and i think that the um panel discussion is is very much about um generating conversation around the theme and um, that we've we've chosen to work around which is queer afrofuturism um, so I think yeah. that it was kind of it, it, like it's kind of like they they all evolved organically, but it, it they are interdependent, if that makes sense. Like the the panel discussion, yes. and the reading list are meant to give more context to the yes. um, to the to the dinner and the um, exhibition. Okay, well, I, I have to say I had a, a little gander at the virtual gallery today, and my goodness, it was absolutely wonderful so much talent and it really you know congratulations to both of you on providing that platform um, and uh, for for artists in that space and um, Karen did many people uh, apply for that um so it was a sort of mixture I think um we had a few people in mind that we were like they're definitely going to apply <laughs> <laughs> and then um, there was a lot of new people that we hadn't met before and I think that kind of turned like turned to um 
us being a community space and us being a community uh, values and based thing and entity um because meeting the new people who had uh, submitted it was really heartwarming because it's like oh my gosh yeah. I've never met you before you're a new person you're you're a new artist and even to take um I think for a lot of younger younger the kids I sound really old to say it, but like younger <laughs> younger generation uh, younger generation artists or creatives a lot of them kind of shy away from even calling themselves artists um, and I think that yeah. this was really affirming for them actually to be yeah. a part of even though it's exhibition I feel like affirmation that's sort of given to you as a creative or as an artist or as a whatever you know whatever you whatever form you do of art yeah. um to be part of the fringe festival is is kind of a big deal and it was really important for us to expand that because we definitely could have like when we were sort of being given this um opportunity to create something with the fringe we could have definitely decided to be like we're just doing a panel discussion and that's it but um yes. I think in the nature of myself and Maya as artists ourselves and also dreamers and enthusiasts <laughs> um, in the gra the grandest of uh, ways. Um, of course, we had to just do everything. Um, but it's yeah. it's very much not it's very much not a thing that I want to take too much credit for actually because I really feel like I'm the my friend put it really well uh, well I'm the comms in community. <laughs> And everyone else has, like submitted their art and is like actually doing like that creative end of things is the community is the unity it's like bringing it together and I'm just really proud yes, of them all. Like, oh. You also should you should also realize and you know for yourself that it takes a lot of hard work to organize that and create that platform sure. where people can express themselves. So you know don't don't uh, give all the credit away. Keep a little bit because you know yourself and Maya. <laughs> I've been working very very hard and it's it, it's very clearly paying off based on what I saw today so um yeah so Maya I'm going to come back over to you and I'm going to ask you a little bit now about how Origins Ella formed um I just wanted to add something to what Karen said there when you when you asked yes. like how many people submitted work the answer is everyone who submitted work is exhibited we didn't turn anything away. We didn't have a selection process. We did not okay. say this work is valued over this work or it's more valid than this work, person's work or more developed than this person's work. Everything that we were submitted went to ex exhibition. And I think that's really important in terms of the intention yes. of the gallery space was to break down a lot of the elitism um, that yes. surrounds our institution visuals mm -hmm. um, and gallery spaces um, and there are a lot of barriers for folks in terms of um, exhibiting art in general there's a lot of barriers for artists in, in terms of like finding spaces where your work can 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 be seen and shown and um, but then yes. there's even doubly triply by queer black folks who you know come up against other institutional and societal and socioeconomic barriers you know what I mean so I yes. think the, yeah. the the important thing to say is of the gallery was to like part of the mission of it was to exhibit everybody who sent us work because all of that work and all of those voices have value and have are very very yeah. valid um, and profound in terms of this discussion of queer afrofuturism and what that looks like sounds like feels like um so yeah so that was just uh, kind of like um the first thing that i wanted to say and then coming okay. to your kind of like second um, question about how Origins Ella began. Um, myself and Karen, I think, um, well, we, we lived together. And um, so that's how we met. And it kind of grew out of our friendship, but also out of conversations that we were having with each other and with people around us. And also just from, I think, a feeling that was happening in, in both of us separately that we needed to um, find more people who had experiences like ours or that resonated with ours. Um, and I think that um, feel, you can feel very isolated in, in, in Ireland in terms of um, finding queer community, queer community of colour, queer black mm -hmm. community, like it is, it is difficult to find each other. And I think when me and Karen found each other, it was like, oh, wow. Oh, like there's other people out here like me facing similar 
um, similar, I guess, like um, similar issues or, or similar problems or similar challenges. Um, yeah. And also having similar experiences. And I think that it was partially meeting each other and, and the relationship between the two of us, but then also going to London, seeing this and, and further afield as well, indeed, um, like we went to Afropunk Paris, we, we did um, sort of like seek out spaces that felt like safe for us seeking them mm -hmm. out abroad internationally and I think that there was an impulse in both of us to create a space for people like us in Ireland and mm -hmm. um, and I guess like bring some of that energy back with us and and use it to kind of um create space uh, where we are so I think it was it was a meeting of two minds with very similar intentions and then it was also um just a genuine need in both of us to create the spaces um, that that we needed and that we knew that other people needed through yes. having through interactions that we were having like there was a very clear need for a space like this yes how awesome is it that the two of you ended up just living together by chance and you know you you both have you know such a similar views and uh, interests that i love when that happens in life i just think like the cosmos are kind of working <laughs> to bring people together like that that's fantastic um okay so karen i'm coming over to you um on saturday destiny is hosting an international panel of expert guests and um, how important is it for people living in ireland to look at the wider world for guidance um i think it's i think it's important um but i also think that it's just an extension again of this the theme that is uh queer for futurism um obviously they have like so they have a lot of experience and expertise in it um i'm just excited for it really yes and uh maya yeah. could you tell me a little bit about uh who is on the panel yeah, so um, we are really blessed and lucky. Um, Kimberly Drew, who is um, Museum Mammy on Instagram, and they're basically an art critic. Um, they've worked in the Studio Museum in Harlem. Um, they are um, like kind of like critic, curator, just an all round um, incredible human who works in the art world. Um, and then we have um, Ivani Fakoya, who is an artist um, based in the UK. We have um, Travis Alabanza, who is a theater maker, performer. We have, um, who was our last person? Oh my God. Um, is it Mel? Uh, it's uh, Mel's. It's Mel Mel's over Mel. Over. Yeah, yeah. Raza Wusu from the who created the Free Black University. And yeah. we're just so we're very excited to have all of these guests because they are all experts in their respective fields. Um there are are also all people who like I think um show young and budding queer black folk that it is possible to do things um do and do incredible things and groundbreaking things and um yeah i'm just really really excited to hear what all of them have to say about this um i think being able to so, have them in the yeah. same room as well being able to have well room virtual room <laughs> but being able to have them in the same <laughs> space is really exciting um because even the feedback from some of them is like oh thank you i'm actually a big fan of x person or i'm actually a big fan of x person so i think it's just mm. all around like a meeting of minds and you know covid is been obviously quite difficult but also it's been quite connecting in this weird way that maybe we wouldn't have had the chance or opportunity to bring these voices together in the way that we're doing it and maybe they wouldn't have been able to be in space with each other yeah. in the way that we're doing yeah. this unless um unless COVID-19 god damn it <laughs> 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 well, it's, it's nice. It's nice to bring out the positives of COVID every now and again, isn't it? So that's that's definitely one of them, Karen. Yeah, it's open to um, possibility for sure. Yeah, actually, speaking speaking of um, COVID nineteen, um, Maya, you are uh, fundraising for queer people of color affected by COVID nineteen. Could you tell us about that fundraiser? 
Sure. Um, so we have a GoFundMe in our, you can access it through our website, but you can also access it through our Instagram and our Instagram handle is at Origins Ella. Um, but the relief fund is basically just there to support our community members through this time, which is a really difficult time for everybody, but it tends to be doubly or triply as hard if you come from several intersectional marginalized groups. Yeah. Um, so there, there just tends to be obviously like more socioeconomic barriers um, and um, like just, just like generally speaking, they're just, uh, we're just, the fund is there basically to support our community through this time. So if people yeah. need help with their rent, if people need help with bus money, if people need help with affording medical care, whatever it is, that's what the mm -hmm. fund of money is fundamentally there for. Okay. It's like, um, it's like relief to help our community through this period, which is challenging for everybody, but is like doubly, triply challenging if you're like living with family members and you can't leave the house or if you are if you've lost your job for whatever reason but also it's been mm -hmm. compounded by institutionalized racism do you know what i mean so there's yes that's kind of why the fund of money is there okay yeah well, and i think it's important to say like oh sorry kelly go ahead no no i was just <laughs> saying it's great that we can get the word out now as well um through stage mm -hmm. door live so, mm -hmm. yeah sorry karen you were saying no, I was just going to say a lot of the, like people who are in our community obviously have jobs in cafes and restaurants and all those sort of places have Service been affected. Everywhere. Yeah, yeah. But um, I think the long, the longer term goal would be to have an ongoing fund that isn't just for COVID because um, mm -hmm. we're disproportionately affected throughout, <laughs> like until like yeah. um, until right the world the. Until racism is dismantled completely, we're going to continue to be disproportionately affected by the acts of systemic racism and everyday racism and, you know, societal, economic, all of those horrible, like, capitalistic mm -hmm. ventures, like, we're all affected by them, but we're not just mm -hmm. affected by them through COVID. And I think it's been really interesting for me seeing that the GoFundMe has been up since March and it still hasn't hit its target. And the, tar the target was actually relatively quite low when you think about it, it was 5,000, but we've actually outpoured more money than we have income. So I would definitely uh, say to people that if they can to, if they can't, put like a euro in or a euro in and share it around mm -hmm. so definitely can help and I'm a big believer in equity over equality and um, because mm -hmm. that can help someone survive in the immediate yes yes actions speak louder than words isn't that right um you know it's, it's important to act on these things and not just speak about them um okay brilliant so I'm um, Maya, I'm going to come over to you uh, for this question. So uh, in Avi May Shaw's reflection as part of your virtual gallery, uh, they write, the only thing you can predict is how you put one foot in front of the other until it's time to stop your walk. So what is the next step for Origins Ella? Um, I think the next step for us personally is rest. Um, me and myself and Karen are actually just very very exhausted after everything with fringe and we also have a publication that is going to be coming out very soon so between these kind of two very mammoth projects that have all been squashed into a very short time frame and um, myself and karen are kind of on our knees in terms of um energy levels and we kind of need to retreat a little bit and rejuvenate and regenerate before we're able to kind of i guess like step back into community work in a way that like properly serves people um, mm -hmm. and and ourselves as well um, but I think also we, with that in mind as well, I think over this next period, we will be planning for 2021 and at the same time doing more like smaller scale and um, community focused events, because all of the things that we're doing right now, we're very aware, of, like the very outward facing. Yes. And mm. it is important to, it is important to turn back inward and like check yes. on the people check on check on all the people who are involved mm -hmm. in all these projects and the people who ultimately these projects are trying to um trying to uplift to yeah. uplift or, so or serve talking, or, or whatever who they're for yeah are you talking mm. um, about making things more personal more intimate 
um, a smaller gathering yeah, or, well, of or, people. Yeah, just doing s smaller events. And I think like yeah. things that are more focused inwards on the community as opposed to outwards, like showing the world mm. what the community has to yeah. offer or like yeah. speaking to people outside of the community. Like it will be, I think the next period of time will be very focused back in on ourselves like mm -hmm. checking in on people seeing how everyone's doing seeing how everyone's doing during covid um, and i also think checking with people how this past these past two projects have gone because i think the most important thing is that whatever steps we take next we need feedback from people yeah. about what we've just done before we take our next steps that's super important mm -hmm. so that every step of the way we are our next movement is being dictated by what people actually need and want you know because there's no point yes. in yeah. Aaron being like next year we're gonna do this huge thing <laughs> and people are actually like yes. listen yeah what, what i what i actually need is movie nights do you know what i mean i mean yes. yes. like yeah, yes. let's do whatever yes. 10 parties well that's definitely that's so important for you know making a community feel included um and like they matter and that's what you guys are there to do so uh, i think it's brilliant so thank you both so yeah. much karen and maya for speaking to us and for you know enlightening us on on your projects your publications your panels your virtual galleries you know you guys are unstoppable so um just keep doing what you're doing thank you both so much thanks so much kelly cheers thank you very much Although she is back to her nine to five job, thankfully in theatre, our associate Sir Janice found a moment to sit down with performer and choreographer Luke Murphy earlier this week to talk about the Step Up Dance Project and his own practice. Let's jump right in. Welcome, Luke. It's good to have you. Hi. Nice to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So I'm going to jump right in. First of all, can you give us a brief overview of the Step Up programme? Yeah, uh, the SIPA program uh, was a response to a feasibility study in 2010, and they basically contacted everyone they could find who trained abroad uh, because there's no conservatory for dance or no training, um, professional training for dance in Ireland. And they kind of did a survey to see how to fill this gap of all of these young performers going off and training abroad. And then for the most part, people would stay abroad and their careers would happen abroad and then never really have an interaction with Ireland afterwards. Um, and they, they put out this this questionnaire and the kind of overwhelming response from it was that at some point in time, you know, it would be great to have uh, full professional training in Ireland and, and have a university program for contemporary dance in Ireland. But at the time, you know, there, there just wasn't the resources there. So they founded the Step Up Project, which is um, it's to encourage people who just recently finished their conservatory training to kind of come back to Ireland and work with an Irish choreographer and maybe an international choreographer for about three months. And then they get a chance to kind of show that material and hopefully the dance community come and see and get to meet these performers and see them work and see them perform. And it's a way for them to kind of integrate into the scene and have long, wonderful careers in Ireland, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's the ideal, isn't it? <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And then everything will be yeah. great forever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if only, if only. We can always hope. So the group of six individuals, certainly that you have this year, I've had a look at their CVs. They're an incredibly impressive bunch of people. So can you tell me about going into the room and working with those amazing, young, exciting people? Where, where do we even begin? They are. They're very, it was really, it was an amazing group this year. Uh, they were really mature and they were really experienced actually. And, and really, um, while people were kind of recently out of training, those are really, you just weren't dealing with people who were kind of deer in the headlights. Um, people were really willing to get down and just get to work. Um, now with COVID and everything, I think everyone was just happy to actually be in a room working, even with, you know, the kind of lengthy restrictions that were in place. Um, so, I normally start, it's a short process, you know, two weeks to kind of make a, make a piece this would be fairly short. So we just started just getting to know each other and we just improvised a lot for a couple of days. Um, and I did a, an exercise where we, we say this, the six people in the room and we say up to three people can be in the space moving at one time and you come and go as you want. So there's no kind of start and stop. You just enter and work and leave, and, um, as you, as you feel, as feels right for you. 
and the three kind of prompts are uh, who you are, who you want to be, and who you think the world see. And that's through a lens of as a dancer. So like the dancer that you are, the way that you move, the kind of vocabulary and rhythm and physical patterns that are that are really feel a home base for you. And then the kind of dancer that you wish you could be. Um, and then also maybe the lens of kind of the dancer that you think the toolkit that you think the world sees so that you think people see when they look at you. Um, because as a as a freelancer and as a dancer in in a like in a freelance in a kind of a gig culture, uh, what happens frequently now, especially on short projects, is that choreographers will very quickly identify really strong, prominent traits in a performer and will use those. And if you have a couple of really strong, prominent traits, then the same things are being used over and over again. Um, and that's not good for the identity of 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 different choreographers work, but it's also really not good for, mm -hmm. for a performer themselves to constantly be used for the same things. So kind of um, kind of identifying what those things are so and also identifying the things that that are part of you that have nothing to do with that. So you can kind of we can kind of crack open that box and say, all right, we're going to we're not going to just restrict ourselves to those things. We're not going to contain ourselves by what we think mm -hmm. the world wants from us as a performers. So that was the beginning. Um, was just getting to know each other that way, and just trying to figure out what the palette was could be between us, and how we could kind of trust ourselves to go in any direction. Uh, so ordinarily, yeah. uh, step up finishes with a finalized piece that then tours nationally. Obviously, that's not possible this year. So you sort of recalibrated, and you spent the past week filming a dance film in Cork. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yeah, well, I was in. Um, I did my kind of big lockdown period down here in the Sheepshead Peninsula, and I was down here when I was contacted about the project, and I kind of said, like, all right, well, you know, if we film down here, I can actually really work on it beforehand, and I can find sites, and I can, I can figure out where I want to go, and I can find a kind of a glue through location that will that will bind this thing together. Um, and um, you know, you know, if someone says they're going to make a film. This because there's a script and there's a storyboard already. There's so much of the work is actually already done in, in terms of transferring it from one medium to another. But frequently with dance, because you're dealing with just this abstract language, what happens is that um, a completely different voice will come in where someone says, "Okay, I'm going to take this movement and I'm actually going to put it over here," and then the intention of the work can be it can be totally changed or, or diffused or, or broken apart because. Um, because the film, uh, a filmmaker can have a completely different concept of what they want to do with it, and that can be wonderful. Um, but for me, I kind of said, like, well, I don't, I don't, I want, I want to make a piece. I don't want to just make movement that someone else is going to use for for their own work. So, um, filming down in Cork let me kind of say, all right, I'm going to conceive of a work that's really about these people interacting with this land and this space and and this kind of nature of rock and grass and wind um so uh so yeah it was really interesting it was everyone got really cold and wet but it was great <laughs> so can you tell me about for you what those differences or challenges are between making work for life performance versus making work for film actually the process of filming it's it's uh it's really satisfying uh because you know normally when you get to a theater you check the work and then there's this kind of really this kind of cold moment where you have to just sit down especially if you're not performing and it, like you sit down and you wait for the show to happen and you're just <laughs> totally disempowered from this thing that you've that has been so important to you you know and like it's such a i just want i i, I just hate that i hate that moment like that's one of the reasons i perform in my work is because I, I hate that moment of just being removed from this thing that I, i've put so much thought into um but then in comparison it's actually in film during the shoot is actually where you have to have your your eyes have to be the most open you're you're working the longest hours you're you're the most heavily involved you're giving feedback and between every single take you're you're able to kind of engage so fully with the material at that time where it's really you know being performed or being made um and that's really that's really satisfying um and it's really exciting to kind of actually be kind of saying no it's almost like a performance that you're able to to pause and just restart and the audience are just like held in stasis in, in the middle of it so you're kind of uh it's like a perfectionist stream actually <laughs> you know <laughs> like our control freak stream yeah <laughs> absolutely i suppose it offers you 
the you control where the viewer's eye is at any moment in film, which you can't do in live performance. So you can capture these amazing magical moments. Yeah, and and you know, performance is so it's so um, it's so fragile, you know, um, especially in movement because like an audience when they're watching a dance show, um, if they really really believe it, if they like that, if it's a really really good show. There's never a moment where they sit back and they think, oh, those dancers are really good because they're just involved yeah. and they just believe that the dance is the language. In a good play, you never kind of notice that someone's accent is good, you know, you, you know, um, and likewise, in a good dance show, you never notice the, the craft around it. It's only when something's bad. And a lot of the time, when, not when it's bad, but when it, it drops or when the reality of it is kind of dropped for a moment. And that's that's really hard to maintain for an hour of performance. You know, it's really hard for a performer and for a company of performers to maintain that level of detail consistently. While in film, with, with filming, with the fact that you can actually pursue the best take, it means that you're able to break the material up to a point that you can actually really pursue, you know, something that really doesn't drop and doesn't lose that level of detail and doesn't, so you can be really meticulous about about why something worked and why something didn't on a performative level. I hope that's reflected in what we actually put together at the end of it. But it was a really nice process. For you, what do you think dance in Ireland needs right now and moving forward? As, as we come out of this weird time and moving forward, what, what do you think that we, it needs? Well, to be absolutely honest, I kind of think it needs a little bit more equity in the funding, um, which was a big part of the conversation with the dance sector and the Arts Council over lockdown. Because, um, the you know, a, when you hire a production manager for a dance production, they don't suddenly say, oh, you only get half as much money from the Arts Council? Let me work for half as much money. So all of these things cost the same. And you're just, the expectation is that you'll meet those costs with half the funding that um and now what's happening is that people in in dance in ireland are actually making really ambitious work on a production level so there's a lot of people making work in ireland that are making um work that requires just um as intricate a level as tech of technical and production support as um as theater companies um and then a lot of a lot of the festivals are actually headlining dance work in their festivals now that that mightn't have been doing that um a number of years ago so actually kind of a, a better equity in terms of acknowledging the expenses that that dance that dance has um would be one thing um because what's ha just what happens is that it's um it's artists fees and it's kind of um double jobbing is what is where things that's where the ends get get made up and then that's where you just have people kind of basically getting burnt out or you have people working, people who aren't directly in the field, like stage managers and lighting technicians and lighting designers. They know they're just they just end up not wanting to work in dance anymore because the circumstances aren't as good. And you know, there's like a branding thing uh, with dance. There's a kind of a, an expectation um, that needs maybe some pulling apart. Um, and I think the way in which, yeah, I think bringing people to a to see a show in a car park um with a with a band and a and a beer sponsor would be a great way to get people to go like okay i can see this and it can challenge me but it doesn't have to challenge my attention span um so i think that is a i think that's happening like i think that's happening and i think there's the quality of work in ireland is really really strong like people are making really really class work here but i think there's a there's stuff around how it's presented and how audiences um think of dance when they hear about it that i think oh, that's something that the form kind of do with a i don't know like ringing and washing out and like a something yeah. <laughs> no i totally agree and um, here's hoping that you know the new young exciting artists coming up through the likes of step up you know that those waves will start to happen and those changes will be made and hopefully we're in for a new era of of dance yeah, here's hoping. There's a lot of great artists making good work here. So that's the main thing. You know, if the quality is there, like people will see it and people will come and then there you go. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Thanks a million. Thank you, Janice. We'll be linking the Step Up project in the description box after the show. This interview was edited for our live show, but as always, the extended interview will be available on our YouTube channel very soon.
Now I would like to welcome Andy Field to our show. Andy is a writer and artist based in London and co-director of Forest Fringe. With his collaborator, Becky Darlington, he makes, a radical, he makes radical performances with young people. Their most recent collaboration, A Rain Walk, is a partnership with the ARC Dublin, with support from Norfolk and Norwich Festival and The Place London. Welcome to the show, Andy, all the way from London today. Yes, yes. Hi, nice to be here. Thank you for having me. Lovely, lovely to have you. Um, so let's dive right in. Um, and how did the concept for a rain walk come about? Um, well, uh, Ruth McGowan at the Fringe, uh, we were, well, my partner Becky and I, we were supposed to be coming to the Fringe this year with a, with a different show, a, a project called Lookout, that again, we, we make working with uh, local young people. Um, and when it became apparent that we weren't going to be able to come to Dublin, uh, Ruth very kindly uh, said, well, what I'd like to do is take the fee that you would have been given for coming and, and challenge you to make something new, uh, something that can happen uh, remotely uh, and be presented within the kind of context of the pilot light edition of the festival. Um, so that was sort of, that, that was the instigating uh, Factor, uh, and then some other, uh, the place and Norfolk and Norwich Festival and the Ark all, all, all became involved as well. And uh, and I suppose the main um, the main thing that we were thinking about um, when we sort of came up with this idea was um, was about the fact that we uh, had all s experienced this. Um, this incredibly strange shared experience, uh, the, the, this, this pandemic that we'd all ex sort of lived through, whether in, whether in Dublin or whether in London or whether in New Zealand or, or wherever else, we'd all been in lockdown, we'd all, experienced, uh, uh, we'd all experienced this thing together, which is not to say we'd all experienced it equally, but, but we had all experienced it together. Um, and so we were very interested in, in, in making a project that explored a shared experience that we all have together, but separately, something that we all uh, can share in, but that, we, uh, that, that, that happens in different times and places. And the, the thing that sort of came to us that was the most kind of essential, uh, elemental version of that shared experience was simply uh, like being in the rain. Um, almost regardless of where you live, you will have experienced what it's like to be in the rain. And it doesn't matter who you are, uh, you, the, you will have been rained on at some especially, point. Especially especially in Ireland, Andy. Especially. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that's, that's true. I don't know. I mean, like, uh, uh, my, my auntie and uncle live in, in Wales and, and they get their fair share of rain too. So. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, certainly, uh, you know, Ireland does well with the rain. And uh, yeah, and so, you know, we thought, well, maybe if the rain becomes our theatre, rain is the place that we all live in. Uh, so no matter, regardless of the fact that we can't all be physically together in the same time and in the same place, uh, we can all be in the rain, whether that's rain in Dublin or whether that's rain in uh, London or in Manchester or, or wherever else and that, that was the sort of instigating uh, thing behind the show. Well that sounds fabulous so uh, what can audience expect then when they purchase their ticket? So when you purchase a ticket for the show you get sent in the post uh, a little a uh, little square box and uh, you're told not to open that box until it's raining outside or it's about to rain and you think you have about 40 minutes to spare. You also sent a link to, uh, to enable you to sort of download the audio that um, we've made with the, the children we worked with on the, on the, on the show. Um, and then all you need to do is wait. Uh, wait for a moment when it's raining or, or wait for a moment when you know, the clouds are gathering and it looks like it's about to start raining. And then you put your headphones in and you open your box and you see what's there for you. And then, uh, then you step out into the rain. 
uh, with an umbrella, if you want. We're not, you know, vindictive. Uh, and <laughs> you, uh, and then you just go on a walk. It's really, really simple. You, you go out on a walk, and on your walk, you are guided by the voices of a group of young people uh, that we worked with to make the show. And it's, it's very much their show, and they are your guides, and they tell you where to go, and they tell you stories, they describe to you what they can see happening around them, and uh, yeah, and they, they, are your, they are your guides on this journey through the rain. Uh, that sounds like so much fun and so interactive. Um, yeah, it sounds very exciting. So you were actually, yeah, you were talking there, Andy, about obviously the shared experience of the rain that we have all shared that experience at one point or another. So in relation to that, we're having to reimagine what a shared experience might look like with, with current restrictions. So how did the desire for connection play a part in the creation of a rain walk? Um, it's, a, it's a good question. I mean, I suppose here in the UK, at least, we've been thinking a lot about connection uh, over the last few years uh, as, you know, as maybe the most yeah. important kind of connection that we have to the world outside this sort of occasionally very parochial little island um, as that world is sort of, as our connection to that world is kind of um, severed in a way. I think a lot of people in this country have been have been thinking about how we can continue to kind of build connections. And also, I suppose we've been thinking a lot about empathy and how how we can um, yeah, how can we we can just have a little bit more empathy towards each other, I suppose. And the 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 aim with this project. So I suppose going back, like at the beginning of lockdown, my, my partner Becky and I, uh, we made another project. It was a very simple little project that invited children to, it was an opportunity for children to sort of be cr creative within the sort of height of lockdown when you really couldn't leave your house or, or you know, your, your neighborhood. And we made this project that in, invited people to be news reporters for children to be news reporters reporting on what's going on in their own house and we got these sort of little radio news reports back from children all over the the world from as far away as uh, Tasmania and uh, and New Zealand um and it really it really made us think about the connections that those children are capable of having to each other and to to children from beyond their immediate neighborhood and their immediate sort of circle of acquaintances. And part of the desire for connection in this show was to create new connections, new, um, uh, new kinds of empathy between children living in very different places and, in, and experiencing the world in very different ways. So when we were making this project, we were working with children. We worked with 12 children to make a rain walk. Um, uh, we worked with four children in East Anglia, uh, living in places like Goldstone on Sea and Norwich and Kings Lynn. We worked with children um, in South London, in East London. Uh, we worked with two children who normally live in Hitchin, but were currently with their mum's family in Greece. And then we worked with. <laughs> Uh, uh, then we work with children from Ireland as well, uh, uh, two children who are uh, on holiday in Kerry, uh, like on a remote <laughs> peninsula with water surrounding them on almost every side, and two children who I think were in, again, in, in like a kind of holiday caravan in Wicklow, I think. Um, <laughs> oh, wow. So, you know, it was just fascinating to be able to sort of bring those children together as a group and ask them to be... We were playing games together. We were asking them to describe what they could see happening outside their windows. We were asking them to ask each other questions. And, um, and I think that that, I was listening to your last guests who were really fascinating, uh, mm -hmm. talking about some of the, I mean, it feels really 
difficult to say, but some of the, the benefits or the advantages of, of lockdown or, or of COVID or, or some of the good things that might have come out of it, the silver linings, I suppose you'd say. Um, and we've definitely been thinking a lot about how the new, you know, the, the kind of expanded digital literacy that we all have and that children have now um, is potentially enables people like Becky and I to be able to not just kind of bring children together in a, in a room, in a workshop, in a, or in a theater in the way we've done in the past, but maybe bring children together virtually and so create these new bonds, these new connections that transcend uh, place or background or, or, or nationality and, uh, and hopefully generate new bonds of, of empathy. Uh, that, that's kind of one of the real hopes with, with this project. Well, it, yeah, it sounds like you're massively succeeding in that, Andy. I can only imagine how, how heartwarming it must have been to, to watch those young makers making those news reports all, from all over the world. That just sounds like such an incredible feat. I mean, were you yourself and Becky proud of that project? You must have been so proud. Yeah, yeah we were. I mean, it was, a, it was a really nice thing to do. Definitely, like, it was nice to feel like, um, you know, in the height of the lockdown, it was nice to feel like you were doing something that was helping people in a small way that, you know, was maybe uh, giving parents a few hours each day where they didn't have to worry about what their children were doing or about kind of entertaining them and giving children, hopefully giving them an outlet to be able to kind of structure their thoughts on this completely bizarre experience that they were living through. Yeah. Um, I mean, yeah. it, it did also make us feel like, it did also make us question some of our life choices, uh, you know, in our small, <laughs> Like lo locked yeah. down in our small flat in East London, <laughs> able to go for like uh, our, our local park was locked because people were disobeying the, the the lockdown. So you know, having to like go out at six in the morning to go for a run around the edge of a locked park when we were getting these reports back from kids in New Zealand who were like, "Oh yeah, I'm in lockdown, so I just went to the beach today." Um, <laughs> but you know, I mean, we we all live in, in different different worlds, right? Yeah, absolutely. But it sounds like, you know, you've given a very creative outlet um, to both parents and kids and provided much needed relief for parents. And I'm speaking as a parent. So thanks <laughs> for that. Um, so, Andy, um, how does uh, this piece um, or the work fit into your personal practice? Because your work seems quite uniquely suited in a way to fit within the confines of, of COVID. Yeah, I, I suppose so. Um, I mean, my the work that I make on my own and and the work that I make with my partner Becky. Uh, so, that, um, in 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 both those practices, are, are really concerned with uh, with encounters. I suppose. Um, uh, I, I I sometimes think of it. Uh, sometimes think of that like a, the human encounter as like the material of that work in the same way that a dancer might think of like the the body as the material or movement or the body as the material of their work or like uh, a, a, a theater director or theater playwright might think of the, the the play script and the stage as the material of their work. I, I, I think my work, I'm always thinking about how you can, um, how you can create encounters that have meaning for, for people. Um, and, and so necessarily that's often, that work is about uh, uh, necessarily that, that work is often about place and it's about um, sort of shaping just sort of shaping the way that people experience each other and the world in, in subtle ways around the edges of that. Um, and, uh, and so I suppose with, with, with the lockdown and with, with, with COVID and you're, you're sort of just doing that in a different way. You're, I suppose yeah. you're, you're thinking again about what, 
what are the terms of this encounter? What are the terms of the encounters that it's possible for people to have under these yeah. conditions? Yes, absolutely. Well, it seems like as well, you know, you're asking uh, people to celebrate, uh, celebrate nature in a way and appreciate nature by going out in the rain and not caring about getting rained on, just embracing it. I, I quite I quite like that idea, to be honest yeah. with you. Um, you know, it's something we could all do with, I think. Um, is, yeah. Is, yeah. Yeah. Immerse ourselves I mean, in nature a bit more. Um, I mean, uh, there's so, one of my favorite pieces of, of art of all time is, is John Cage's um, 433, which is the famous silent piece, right? And people, people talk about it as the silent piece, but I, I think it's, to me, that piece is just, uh, is, is not four minutes and 33 seconds of silence. It's, it's four minutes and 33 seconds of listening to the world with the concentration that you'd normally reserve for listening to music. And, and I suppose I, this piece, the, the rain, a rain walk is kind of something similar in some ways that it, it's, it's an it's 40 minutes of paying attention to the rain and the sort of banality of the, your the, your your neighborhood in the rain with the kind of concentration that you'd normally reserve for paying attention to uh, a performance on a stage um and so hopefully that that's that's interesting that that hopefully that will that will make people think about their relationship to the rain and to weather yeah. and to ecology and nature in general in, in, in a different way. Yes, it's a, a completely different perspective. So it sounds like, a, you know, a lot of fun. But um, thank you so much, Andy, for, for joining us. Um, tickets are still available for a rain walk. So we'll provide a link to that after our show. Thanks a million, Andy. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Great. I had the opportunity to chat with live artist turned digital artist Matthew Bracco, who joined us early in the morning from his Brooklyn abode. Matthew's work explores interactive rituals in a theatrical setting, and his collaboration with Frank Sweeney. Initiation is part of Dublin Fringe Festival's online offerings. Hello, Matthew. How are you? Hi, I'm doing quite well. Uh, how are you doing? Great. It's lovely to be joined by you all the way over in New York. And I know it's quite early for you at the moment. So uh, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Look, my absolute pleasure. If there's anything that gets me up at eight o'clock in the morning, it's attention. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Spoken like a true uh, theatre maker and artist. That's brilliant. So I'm going to delve right in, Matthew. The show begins late at night. Uh, without giving too much away, what can the audience expect? <laughs> yeah, that's been the struggle with this show is, is not to give too much away. Uh, well, it's the, so it's the show that watches back. So you are seen on your Zoom webcam at all times throughout the show. Um, there are tasks that you have to complete with a set of sort of ritual, ritual objects that you have to assemble before the show. Uh, so it's very interactive. It's very live. Um, there is that feeling that you are as much a, a participant as also you're somehow a subject. <laughs> Um, while also being the audience. So it's this way of attempting to make a Zoom call feel live, despite the fact that it's on Zoom, because I think we've all seen a lot of Zoom theater that is very like, like we're gonna do Shakespeare on Zoom, which is fine. Uh, but for me, it loses just some of the inherent liveness of theater. That's what makes it interesting for me. And that, um, explicit exchange between the audience and the performers that's necessary when everyone's in the same room isn't necessary when everyone's on zoom like there's a lot of shows that don't have it so i with with initiation we really try to bring that aspect to it so you feel as an audience member that there is something that's required of you there is some sort of artistic exchange that's taking place between you and between the piece and between the performers um so it has that that aspect to it. It starts very, 
very nightclub, very fun. Um, so you get sort of that going out with your pals, exploring a new uh, club, meeting somebody new, vibe that you might have been missing during lockdown. Uh, and then it gets a little more interesting. Oh, that sounds so intriguing. And I, for one, I'm definitely one of those people that has missed going to nightclubs during lockdown. I love a good dance. Mm -hmm. I love a good party. So, yeah, it sounds so, like something, you know, that a lot of people would love to dive into now, you know. Uh, fantastic. So uh, how did you collaborate with, with Frank on this? Um, how did you rehearse this piece? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. Uh, Frank is wonderful. I had been planning to do a piece with, I'd, I'd submitted a piece collaborating with Frank for the Fringe Festival uh, for this year. And that didn't, wasn't able to happen because it was like a site specific piece in a nightclub, um, which would have been impossible with the COVID restrictions. Uh, not very similar to initiation. Um, but then Ruth came back to us and very gloriously was like, well, we'll commission you and Frank to make a piece that people can do from their homes. So that was kind of the start of the process was, was Ruth being like, well, this is kind of what we need from you. Something people can do from their homes and something that has a sort of nightclub vibe. Uh, and besides that, that, sort a, of the whole... Was that a daunting challenge? Uh, Matthew, was that like quite when when that was first presented to you? Were you like, oh, that sounds cool, or was that like, a, oh my gosh, how are we going to do this? It was a little of both. Uh, it was a, okay. it was like amazing. We're getting a commission, like we're getting paid to make art right now, which is not happening for. There's a lot of people who that's not happening for. So very, very lucky, very grateful to be able to do that. Very excited to be asked to do that by Fringe, especially by Ruth, who I have so much love and respect for. And I think she's like such a champion of the arts. Adore her. So for her to come back to us and be like, well, we want you to make something that's like this for us. It was like incredible. Um, initially daunted by the fact that people had to do it from their homes. We tried so much like in our brains to figure out if there was a way we could do it like weirder than Zoom, like something that, that wasn't like they're on Zoom and we're on Zoom and we're all on Zoom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but we, we couldn't. <laughs> we, we, we just, I mean, because we'd had other, like our, our creative process was like leading us to, like this kind of an idea. And the only way that we could really realize it the way we wanted to was to do it on Zoom. Um, so the daunting thing, the challenge, like make a nightclub-y show for Fringe, easy. like. That's what I love to do. That's what I, you know, I'm good at. Um, make it via Zoom was the part that was like, oh my God, okay. Let's figure out how to make a show, the kind of show that I like to make, which involves this massive give and take between the audience that you can do on Zoom. That's still sort of alive. That's still valid. That doesn't kind of lose everything that's good about it because um, there's these screens in the way. You know what I'm saying? Yes, uh, I know exactly challenge. what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, so you describe yourself, Matthew, as, as a live artist. But now, mm -hmm. as you've said, you've had to adapt and, you know, through Zoom and you're now a digital artist. Um, what differences <laughs> have you had to make in your practice? Because that's quite a big um, change. Yeah, I, I still feel like a live artist because the show is very live. I mean, we might not be in the same room, but that doesn't mean it's not live. Um, but there are a lot of things that have had to change. A lot of stuff pre-recorded uh, and put to music because Frank is such an incredible sound designer and DJ and music producer. Uh, so he's created a lot of incredible original music for the show. Um, so we have a lot of pre-recorded audio just to make it work and sound amazing and sound immersive via Zoom. Uh, and my preference, of course, would be to do everything live, but the technology just doesn't really allow it to be excellent and live in that way. Uh, so the experience for me isn't as live, even though the experience we've, so we focus more on making the experience for the audience live. Um, yeah, so I think of myself as a live artist and a theater maker. And this is sort of a combination of those two streams. Like it's live, it's very live in the fact that you as the audience member 
um, are experiencing the things that are happening in real time. And there's real time consequences based on your reactions and what you choose to do as an audience. Um, yeah, it is live art. <laughs> oh, yeah. So in, in uh, you know, in that case, do you still get a little bit nervous then before you perform? Or is there kind of a bit of a safety net that you're behind a screen? Um, I think there's a there's a safety net that I'm behind a screen. There's a safety net that I'm not doing that much of the performing. Uh because a lot of it's sort of this beautiful pre-record that we're controlling in very interesting ways. Uh, so the, there's a little bit less of the nerves because of that. Um, there's a little bit more of the nerves because we don't know how the audience is going to in, encounter the piece and what their choices are going to be. And that's always very exciting. There's some really pivotal sort of moments that we are all, we, we have like our little WhatsApp on the side where we're just talking to each other about the show. Um, so we're always like just, <laughs> <laughs> when these pivotal moments come over, like, oh, who's gonna do it? Who's uh, like, what's the reaction gonna be? What's gonna happen? And that's where it's really, really exciting for us. So we're like, oh, what's gonna happen? We're, we're always making predictions making predictions yeah. taking bets about who's going to chicken out who's going to go through with it like talking about who's enjoying the show and who's not and that's really enjoyable i mean that gives me sort of a little bit of that live rush of like oh who's going to do it what's going to happen um, and then of course because it's zoom i'm always terrified that i'm just going to like hit the wrong button and explode everyone's yeah. computers <laughs> that's the joy of working with technology isn't it um yeah so you mentioned there that you guys are kind of chatting through whatsapp is that kind of um how frank goes about teching this show or um and how did he how did he design it um like this interactive show like the 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 process sort of was like i wrote the script and then frank and i talked a lot about the script and then i rewrote the script and then frank started making sounds to go over the script and then we sort of just like passed files back and forth via uh, Google, via WeTransfer, via WhatsApp, um, just whatever was most convenient in the moment um, to make the show what it was. The show, so the interesting thing is that Frank, despite being by far the most technically competent, isn't actually running the show. Marissa and I are running the show um, from our respective apartments in America. She's in New Jersey at the moment, and I'm in New York, uh, in Brooklyn. So uh, the show is running off our two computers here. And Frank is sort of listening and making sure everything sounds good. And he's there for like the sound check. And he's like, oh, okay, everything sounds great. Make sure you don't do this. <laughs> I'll, I'll be sharing my screen with QLab in it. And he'll be like, okay, now put this at zero, put this at negative seven, and put this at whatever uh, to make everything sound good. My, one of my last questions to you, um, Matt, would be, you know, say there there are obviously people who don't like going to nightclubs, right? They don't like that experience as as a thing. Like, would this show have something to offer those people? Do you think that they might have like this is completely different to a normal nightclub? Like, no, come and try it out. This is great. Like, what would you say to those people? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of the reason people don't like nightclubs are very valid. They're noisy, they're crowded, they're expensive. Um, everyone judges you. Like, these are all things that happen at nightclubs, and that don't really happen at our show. Like, it's not crowded. Right. You're in your home. You can be very comfortable. Uh, you get sort of the, the buzz, the enjoyment of, like, a good bit of music, the use of your imagination like excitement, but there's no, all the danger is fake, right? Like it's danger that we've created yeah. within the show. You're never actually yes. in any danger. So it's fun danger instead of like actually scary danger. Like <laughs> no one no one can actually hurt you through the show because you are sitting at home uh, yeah. watching on your computer screen, but you can still feel that sort of like, oh, I'm, I'm outside, I'm mingling with people, I'm having a good time, there's something exciting that's happening to me. Uh, and regardless of whether you love the nightclub experience or you hate the nightclub experience, I think the show still gives you something that a lot of people are missing right now, which is that sort yes. of excitement and that thrill. Yeah, human interaction as well, by the sense of it. Yeah. 
Yeah. Wow. Matthew, I, I, I don't know if that hasn't sold it. I really don't know what will. I, I, I'm so excited by that conversation. Um, thank you to yourself and uh, to Frank as well for creating what seems to be a fantastic piece that people are going to enjoy. And I wish you uh, all the best with the run and break a leg. And thanks again for joining us at this, the wee hours of the morning over in New York. Thank you so much for having me. It has been a delight. Uh, Matthew's initiation runs through to the 19th of September and tickets are still available. We'll provide the link after the show. My interview with Matthew was edited for our live show, but you won't, you won't want to miss the extended conversation, which will be available on our YouTube channel very soon. Our last guest on this evening's show is the wonderful Eva O'Connor. Eva is no stranger to a Fringe Festival, with several awards from Brighton Fringe, Edinburgh and Dublin Fringe under her belt already. Her show, Mustard, will run at the Peacock from the 15th to the 17th of September. Welcome to the show, Eva. How are you keeping? I'm good, thanks. How are you? Yeah, good. Delighted to have you on with us. So Mustard premiered at Edinburgh Fringe in 2019 and won the Fringe First and Lustrum Award, which is amazing. Um, how did this idea start and um, how long have you been working on it? Um, I wrote it actually not long before the Edinburgh Fringe last year. It was it was sort of a bit of a mad, bizarre passion project. I was doing a lot of writing for TV and I was feeling a bit um sort of, I don't know, cooped up or confined by just like having to get scripts done for deadlines. And um, yeah, I just kind of started writing Mustard as like a weird sort of poetic experiment. Um, I had performed a lot of like cabaret nights using like mustard and peanut butter as a kind of performance arty thing where I would put it all over my body and shave it off into sandwiches for the audience. So I was always kind of interested <laughs> in food as a condiment. Um, yeah, as, it's like condiments as a coping mechanism. Then I got a slot at the Fringe that was only a week, so I was like, oh, I'll go, I'll see how we get on. And yeah, it ended up being like um, like a, a, a weirdly successful show. Yeah, fantastic. Um, so amazing that you could just write something like that in such a short space of time that was such a hit. That just shows your, your talent, Eva. So um, how has the show uh, changed um, in light of current circumstances? Well, it hasn't actually changed at all. I mean, it's I guess it's kind of handy that it's like a fairly light-footed one-person show. Um, so uh, I think I, I, I'm quite lucky that it's already kind of made and like in the bank and it's obviously amazing to be able to actually just get on stage again. Like, I think I've never appreciated live performance as much. Like, I just think like fair play to the Dublin Fringe for making it happen, like with guidelines changing all over the place and everything. Yes. So yeah, the show is the same. Um, I'm yeah I'm just really happy that it, it gets to have a longer life like it's, there's that really nice feeling of coming back with the show when you know like the really hard work of getting it on it on its feet is already done um so yeah obviously I've never performed it at home before so doing a week in Dublin then we're going to Ennis and I'm from Clare so it'd be really nice to be at home and we're performing in Scaries as well and obviously you can't really do like a full tour at this point just because of it's so uncertain everywhere but even just to get like a week or two Worms, it feels like kind of like I was rehearsing today and just was like I was like I'm never ever going to complain about rehearsing again <laughs> it's just to be in a space or even like no matter how tired you are or exasperated you are like you're like oh I have the best job in the world yes absolutely I think everybody's appreciating going back to the theatre being able to watch things live again and uh, because it's just you know it's not the same over zoom personally I, I, I find it's much nicer to look at live performance um but you've worked in in collaboration with fish amble on several projects now um how has uh, their support helped you in your process um or your creation um oh, they're, or they're even the eventual people. performance yeah no I, I i'm really lucky that they're working with us on the show um i did maz and bricks with them which um was kind of we performed that in the we toured Ireland in the run up to the repeal referendum and then we went to Edinburgh with that and we actually went to New York with Mazenbricks this January when COVID was like just beginning like there was so many chats 
when we were actually in New York being like, oh, have you heard about this virus? And I'm like, I feel so lucky that we got that run in before it all went mad. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, Fish and Blood were like, un, like so supportive on that. And then I actually made must, Mustard with Hildegard Ryan, who's my director um, uh, on Mustard and lots of other work that I do. We made it kind of just together. And then we were like, we weren't sure about who would produce it or what its life afterwards would be. So like now that we've got like Fish Amble on board, it's just so great when, when you find people like in your industry that are like behind you. Um, it's so nice to like kind of keep those relationships going. So I'm delighted to be working with them again because you just, you know, when Fantastic. you know people pretty well, you can kind of just get back into the flow pretty easily. So I feel very lucky to work with them. Brilliant. Um, and I'm sure they feel lucky to work with you as well, Eva. Um, so as we've already mentioned earlier, you're no stranger to festivals. So what makes the Dublin Fringe unique? What sets it apart for you? Well, I just think it's so special to be at home performing in Dublin. Like there's just, like such a buzz around town at that time of year, I think. Obviously, it's like quite quiet at the moment. But like even today, we were rehearsing in Fringe Lab in Temple Bar and I was like looking out on Meeting House Square and I got to kind of watch some of the play Will I See You There that was being formed. Um, and it was just like there's always like little things going on around or even just that feeling of, like even if you can't make it to a show at that time, but you know that people are in like such a close proximity also preparing. And I don't know, like it's kind of hard to put your finger on, but I just I think again, like now post COVID more than ever, there's just this like special buzz around Dublin. And I think like the fringe in Dublin as well, like Bruce has done such an amazing job at like kind of cultivating this sort of family and sense of community. So obviously if you're in Edinburgh, it's an amazing sense of community, but on like a much, much larger scale. But I feel like when you're back in Dublin, it's kind of like a little family. That's lovely. And you're so right. It's lovely to kind of see that buzz happening again, because obviously the theatre industry was so still for the last couple of months. So generating that buzz was probably, you know, quite challenging in a way. And and she's really Ruth has really done that. So fair play to her. And um, so what do you as a performer prefer? Do you prefer the fringe? Do you prefer a usual run or a touring show? Oh, I don't know. It's kind of hard to pick. Um, I, I love doing the Dublin Fringe every year. I've done the Edinburgh Fringe since for like last year was my 10th year doing Edinburgh because I went to Edinburgh University. So like start, I started, I did my first show there when I was like 18. Um, and, you know, we were on absolute shoestring. Like the, we were kind of, we just, we did it because we had our accommodation there. So we could like just about afford to put on a show there. And then it all kind of spiraled <laughs> from there. Um, obviously fringes are like especially Edinburgh Fringe can be quite grueling Um, it's nice when you get like commissioned to do a proper play in a proper theatre with a proper tour Um, so I don't know which I would <laughs> choose as my favourite but the spirit of the fringe is very special. Brilliant Um, so how do you go about then um setting pen to paper like what what is your personal practice on that? No, that's kind of a tricky question because sometimes people ask me about like writing plays or like how I feel when I'm writing them or what I remember about the process. I feel like most of my plays just kind of go by in a bit of a blur and I can't really exactly remember how I felt or what I was thinking at the time. Um, I write like a lot anyway. I've kind of, I write, write most days like in one way or other, even if I'm not setting out to write an actual play. Um, and yeah, I don't know. Like I suppose I never like, Partic you know, sometimes people are like, oh, do you, do you always want your shows to either be political or people are often like, oh, so your show's about mental health. You must love to write about mental health. My, I think most of my stuff is, I would like to think it's character driven and then you kind of have this like kind of story living in your head or these people and you kind of have the urge to bring them to life as opposed to be like, I want to make a political point. Um, so yeah, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure what I, what I am feeling at the time, but I do know that if I'm not writing, feel like my life is kind of just like whizzing by me in a bit of a blur so I feel like writing is like kind of like a stabilizing thing in my life that I find really useful just even for my own sanity. Yes yes and um, so uh, like has your practice like changed at all in the last couple of months because it's obviously you know completely different circumstances that you know that we're all living in now yeah. so did you find yourself like creatively driven or was it more of a oh god actually you know because a lot of people found it very hard to write during lockdown oh yeah I actually found it impossible I found I felt so dead inside for 
all of lockdown. I just was like, oh, okay, I am no longer a creative person. Um, I'm a fraud, better get another job. Um, Because <laughs> I just felt so, I just felt like, I think just so much of inspiration for writing just comes from your daily life. Or like, if you're stuck in a rut, you go out and meet your friends or you go swimming or whatever it is. And then you come back and you're like, oh yes, that scene I couldn't finish, now I can finish it. I just felt like I had yes. absolutely no interest in putting pen to paper. But actually, the other night I was lying in bed and I had like a, what I thought was probably actually a bad idea, but I thought was a good idea at the time. Yes, my creativity may be back. Great. And I suppose here's like a, um, a difficult question for you, maybe. But um, do you have because you've you've written so many great successful shows now, um, Eva. So do you have a personal favorite that you love to perform or that you have loved? To oh, perform? God. Uh, well, <laughs> I have to say mustard is my favorite at the moment because it's so kind of weird and fresh. And I put mustard all over my body during the show, which is a. <laughs> that's not that sounds really it's fun yeah. um yeah i don't know it's quite hard to pick your favorite show because each of them kind of mark a moment in time and they're all special in their own way yeah. you get to kind of work with different brilliant people on each show um but yeah i guess it, it's really fun when you're kind of on something new that feels really kind of like fresh and a bit different and um, especially if you've been touring yeah. something for a long time there's the joy of knowing it really well but then i think there's that excitement that comes with something that feels like a little bit more dangerous because it's more new, you know. Yeah, that's true. Sorry, I totally made you choose between your babies there. Uh, that's very hard. <laughs> I'm not <pregnant. laughs> So what um have you taken from all of the last couple of months? What what you know has come to the foreground for you? Oh, I don't know. That's a tough question. I'm not sure actually. Like I was just saying you know, it still feels very like, um, I feel like restrictions are very much still in place. And even like, I live in London, and I just saw that the kind of certain outdoor restrictions were brought back in yesterday. And I, I think I still feel actually like a bit apprehensive in general about the industry, to be honest. Um, mm -hmm. And I really hope that this is like the fringe marks the start of a new beginning and a new way of doing things and loads of opportunity for more work and exciting things. But Every now and again, I'm like, or are we going back into six months of lockdown? So I don't know if I've actually reached any kind of like great philosophical enlightenment moment. Um, but I just feel really grateful to be doing a show next week, basically. Yes, That's my main you're not too. alone in those feelings, Eva. You're not alone. There's so many artists that we've been talking to over the last couple of weeks. You know, we're 21 weeks doing this now today, and it really wow, has, been, there has been amazing. Yeah, it's great. But, you know, there, it's it's lovely to hear that people are, you know, kind of in solidarity with those feelings. You know, there's there's a community of artists that are feeling that kind of vulnerability of, you know, the uncertainty. Yeah. But as you say, and I think it's, we're, lovely that's, it's also the great thing about the arts is that we are such a community. And I feel like we're like the most resilient of all people. It's just like, exactly. it feels like there's no, <laughs> we're always trying to either make enough money or like work really hard to get our work on. And they're like, oh, COVID, yeah. come on, give me a break. <laughs> yes, we are super hardcore and long may it last. <laughs> um, yeah. So listen, Eva, thank you so much for joining us. Um, the Dublin Fringe run as well um, as your tour to Glore in Ennis and Scaries are sold out. Um, are there any uh, rumours of another tour in the future for those of uh, those um, people at home who well, are dying no, to catch the it's show. We're saying our Ennis, Ennis dates and Scary dates are not sold out yet, so it's just the Peacock run that's sold out. Um, okay, boom. and it will be coming back. I'd say like we're going to do a tour with Fish Amble definitely. So we'll be visiting all the all the usual places, um, which will be really exciting. I'm not entirely sure when that will be, um, but yeah, hopefully it will come back. Great. Well, I look forward to it. I actually might catch it in Scary's in that case because it's only up the road from me. Yeah. Great. Okay, brilliant. So thanks again, Eva, and break a leg for the show. Oh, thank you. Oh, what a week it has been. 
The streets of Dublin are alive, quite literally, with the Dublin Fringe Festival. And for those who weren't able to grab the coveted ticket to an in-person show, Twitter has been ablaze with photos and reviews of shows both online and offline. The team at Murmuration took over our Instagram the last few days with a behind-the-scenes look at their production of Will I See You There? Murmuration's show is having its closing night tonight. Sure, closing nights won't be filled with hugs and pubs, but if our show tonight didn't make it clear, theatre in many forms is making its way back. We're not out of the woods yet, though. The number of COVID cases still continues to rise, but there is cause for joy. Today is theatremaker.ie's 21st episode of Stage Door Live. In Ireland, we like to celebrate a little for 21st birthdays. When we were born on the 12th of April, we were wide-eyed and had little clue of what was in store for us. Like a toddler growing up, we have experienced our growing pains. Our teens began to feel a bit of a drag as we realized just how much work life or producing a news program actually is. And we learned to drink a little in our late teens just to get through the tougher news from the government, the sector and just the world around us. But now we're all grown up and moving forward. We are also excited to be partnering with the Dublin Arts and Human Rights Festival in October to take our conversations about the role and responsibility of theatre in platforming and promoting diverse narratives to a wider audience. This is a really important topic for us and we're honoured to have this opportunity. This week, with the support of DCU, we launched our online newsroom with two fabulous writers from DCU's MA in Journalism programme. Our associate producers of Stage Door Live will continue to write their weekly blogs, but hopefully our website, theatremaker.ie, will also become a reliable source of news for you. In a couple of weeks, Stage Door Live will take a much needed holiday. Just a couple of weeks off as we do a little bit of reorganizing among our team and prepare to launch some additional programming, but also maybe relax a little bit. <laughs> we have you to thank for keeping us going. Thank you for your encouraging words and support on social media and into our email inboxes. I speak for everyone here at Stage Door Live in saying that our little venture to support the sector has actually gotten us through the lockdown. Now, I must mention there is another way you can support us. If you have the means, we also ask that you consider becoming a patron of theatremaker.ie. As an unfunded group of theatre makers coming together to make sure all of these resources, funding is scarce. You can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash theatremaker.ie. We are excited to continue to support the sector. Cheers to 21 more episodes and a lot more. I wish I had uh, something a little stronger to cheers to you, but it's only water for now. But I'm just going to sip it anyway. Cheers, guys. Here's to leave, uh, here to leave us with a reading of Goddess of Dignity by Emer Sheenhan is Aoife Honahan. Aoife is a Cork woman who trained in Melbourne, Australia, before returning to Ireland to pursue a career in acting. She is a member of the core ensemble and most recently played a lead role in Tom Cosgrove's upcoming horror feature, Hillwalkers. Good night, everyone, and we'll see you next week at 7 p.m. Hi, I'm Aoife Honahan. I'm an actor and a writer and a member of the core ensemble theatre company. The poem that I'm going to read for you today is written by a Cork poet, Emer Sheehan. Uh, not only is Emer a wonderful poet, but she's also one of my oldest and dearest friends. So it gives me great pleasure to share her poem with you. Great pleasure. The title of the poem is Goddess of Dignity. I am the goddess of dignity. Walk towards me. You have heard my calls through soul planted seeds, seeds that become imagery, imagery that you have come to trust. Walk towards me towards my image. Venerate me, not the worn out image of less than woman, mother, daughter, slave. Shed it. Shed it. Let me enter those collapsed pockets of shame and fearful hideouts. Let me show them dignity again. Let them remember. Let them remember 
the sweetness and graciousness of your soul. Let me walk inside of you. Let my light resurrect your true voice. A voice whose source ripples from the earth's core. A voice whose source we share. This voice knows truth. This voice knows wisdom. Let it speak. Let it speak.